The enemy works overtime trying to get you to devalue what you have and misunderstand who you have. But until your spiritual eyes of understanding are opened to the presence of God and in turn satisfied by only the things of God, you can have all the status, money, toys, and popularity in this world, but you'll continue to be crushed under the weight of insecurity connected to this lie of lack. And hear me today, some of you need to understand, you wouldn't understand some of the depths of God's goodness, grace, and mercy on display in your life had you not learned it in that circumstance that you're facing. It doesn't make the circumstance better, but it does help my inner man be able to walk through it knowing that my God, who will supply all of my needs according to His glorious riches, is with me in it. If you got a Bible, open up to 2 Peter chapter 1. As we jump into the Word today, that's going to be our focal text. I will admit to you right off the bat, we are going to read a lot of Scripture today, okay? So hopefully you're okay with that. Um, if not, deal with it. We're going to be there anyways. But we're going to read a lot of Scripture today. Second Peter chapter 1 is going to be our focal text. And as you turn there, I want to set a little bit of the context for you so you understand what we're jumping into. Uh, what I love about Scripture is that... Um, the words, every word in this book is inspired by the Holy Spirit and is profitable for my life for teaching, correcting, guidance, and training in righteousness, okay? But even the structure of the Bible speaks to us. Let me, let me help you understand. First Peter and Second Peter, both written by the Apostle Peter, First Peter speaks to a lot of the external pressures and persecution that the church is facing in this present day here in, in the Bible. Speaks to a lot of the external persecutions that are, that are coming against the church. While Second Peter, the Apostle Peter chooses to speak more so to the internal pressures and the internal persecutions that are going on, the internal anxieties to maybe be swayed or reach for things that in a, in a time of difficulty or in circumstances that are a little turbulent. And, and even in that, we see that oftentimes as people, we love to and we prioritize paying attention to all of the external circumstances in our life, but most often, if we're honest, we neglect the internal chaos that's going on that can be just as, if not more dangerous. That there are, yes, some things around us we ought to pay attention to and be aware of and seek the Lord's guidance as to how we navigate this season. But let us not neglect the internal issues because even though it looks like we're hiding it, we're not really that good at it. And it is there and we ought to deal with the inner man and allow the Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out and the apostle peter is writing and second peter is very much uh could be considered his last words some of his very last words on this earth most specifically it is it is probably written to this these communities in asia minor sometime between the time of 64 a.d and 68 a.d and the reason that's important is because he is nearing the end of his life ultimately he be, he will be killed by nero and so we look and we there's a sense of urgency that peter has in writing this Peter, th this letter, so to speak, is written a little differently than most letters in that it is a lot more pastoral than it is friendly. It is a lot more formal than it is friendly. And we, we sense an urgency and, and Peter is, is really like uh, encouraging and challenging the believers in that day to have a diligence and a, and, 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 and a focus on their personal lives and not be swayed by all of these false teachers that are rising up. These false teachers that are trying to change the instructions of God, change the, the, uh, the, the, um, the encouragement of Jesus and the instructions on how to live and, and how to live a godly life in order to make their life more convenient to prop themselves up, to say, in order to have a more comfortable life, I'll just change some of the instructions and, and it'll benefit me and it'll exalt me. And the Apostle Peter is writing with a sense of urgency to say, hey, in this present hour, the judgment of God is coming at some point. And I know that God is patient. I know that God is long suffering, but judgment is also coming. And so don't be swayed. Don't give in to the lust of the flesh. Stay true to God. Grow in your knowledge of him and he will he will uphold you. And friend, I don't know if you know this, but there ought to be a sense of urgency in the day in which we live presently. And if we're not paying attention to that, we may be not 
looking around, but there is a sense of urgency what we ought to have as followers of Jesus, to be diligent with the instructions of God, to grow in the knowledge of God, understanding that the end is drawing near. That it doesn't mean it's tomorrow, but how many of you know we are closer to the end today than we were yesterday? And we ought to be paying attention. And Peter is writing and challenging these believers to keep going. And what I love about Peter is this. Peter, um, it, it is very easy for all of us to find ourselves in Peter's life. If you study Peter, you'll, you'll realize that um, Peter is sometimes proud, oftentimes impulsive, and has a tendency to put his foot in his mouth consecutively in like a matter of hours. He means well, but doesn't always like, doesn't always translate how he wanted it to. He kind of oftentimes lives this life, it's like one steps forward, seemingly two steps back, even as he relates to Jesus. He'll be really confident because God made him bold and he'll, he'll want to walk in boldness, but his boldness will step outside of the bounds that Jesus gave it to him and, and he'll actually be bold at Jesus and Jesus will tell him, get behind me, Satan, right? That's one step forward, two steps back if, you ever, if, if I ever saw it. Peter will, uh, Peter will, um, Peter is, tells Jesus, I will never deny you. I, I, will, I will never, like, I will never, I will never say that I don't know who you are. I will never, never deny you, only to find out that all it took was a 15 year old girl to stand between Jesus and, like, Peter knowing about him. And he says, I don't even know, I don't know this guy. I don't know who you're talking about. All she says is, Do you know Jesus? Aren't you the one that's been with him? Uh uh. Uh uh. He, he kind of has these great moments and then, like, the next day has a bad moment. You ever been there? Peter will have a lot of courage, a lot of confidence. It, I don't know if you know this, but it was Peter's idea to walk on the water, not Jesus' idea. Peter asked Jesus if he could go out. And so Peter steps out of the boat and he's like having a really good moment. And then all of a sudden it like goes away. He, was, he had faith one moment and then all of a sudden he gets scared and begins to sink and Jesus has to rescue him. And what I love is that Jesus is patient with Peter throughout all of it. Jesus is long suffering with Peter. In fact, Jesus will pray for Peter in Luke chapter 22, knowing that, that he's got a call on his life that, that he has an amazing opportunity to be a leader for the kingdom of God, Jesus will pray this, will speak this to Peter in Luke 22, verse 32. He will say, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, that you will strengthen your brethren. That's good news for us today. That if Jesus could use Peter, he can use us. As much as we may fail at times, as messed up as we might be, at various moments, some more than others at different seasons. God can still use you. God desires to still work in and through your life and in mine. And in fact, God will use Peter as a catalyst to plant the New Testament church. And these are Peter's dying words in 2 Peter chapter 1, we read, Simon Peter, a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so pause for a second. Right off the bat, we see something very interesting about Peter's life. This is not the same old, sometimes prideful, oftentimes impulsive Peter. This is a Peter who has humbled himself and understands here that I only have authority because I am submitted under authority. I only have any ability to speak into your life because I have, been, I have given full access to the Lord to speak into mine, to lead my life. He says, I am a bond servant first and foremost, and I am an apostle, but make no mistake about it, I'm a bond servant first. I, I serve him, I do what he says, and though I have authority, it's only because I am submitted under authority. He continues, and he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So his desire, Peter saying, my desire for you in these last moments that I have is that grace and peace would be multiplied in your life. How? In the knowledge of God. In other words, I want you to know God more, and as you do, you'll experience more grace and peace in your life. What you want, you'll get as you grow in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And his divine power, in other words, by the Holy Spirit, has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. So Peter is saying, there is this lust in our world that, that I, I, want, I, wanna, I wanna help keep you from as much as I can. I wanna encourage you, don't give in to the lust of this world and begin to reach for things that you want but don't need or that you are convinced maybe by others that you might need. Stay true to your creator, follow him. In fact, grow in knowledge of him daily by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you do, grace and peace will be multiplied to you. Well, Peter's helping us understand in this, he's saying you've been given all things. I need you to understand, you've been given all things. Everything you need, you already have. Everything. Everything you need, you already have access to in the person of the Holy Spirit. Scripture will say that the Holy Spirit is an earnest deposit in your life when you come to know Jesus as Savior. An earnest deposit for your eternal security. And so if you have the Spirit of God, you have access to all of who God is. Peter said, don't believe this lie of lack that is going around that somehow some way is saying because of the circumstances that you face, somehow God is withholding good from you. It's not true. And it's causing believers to reach for things, to lust after things. And he says, don't lust after something. Understand you already have what you need. It's not about searching for something else, it's about getting to know your God more, and in doing so, your eyes are open to the depths of the grace that you already have. I just don't understand how great it is because I haven't understood everything about God. But as I understand more, and hear me, it's not exhaustive, you'll never understand all that there is to know about God. But it ought to be our eternal pursuit as followers of Jesus. And this is what Peter is encouraging these believers with his last words continue to seek after him. Peter is fighting for this, saying of all the things, there's a lot of things that you shouldn't fight about and we don't need to fight for, but there are definitely some things to fight for. Friend, your marriage is worth fighting for. Your kids are worth fighting for. This faith is worth fighting for. His kingdom values are worth fighting for. And Peter says, I, 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 this is worth fighting for for me. I'm gonna make sure you understand. Continue to grow in the knowledge of God. Interestingly, Peter, one of the foremost apostles in all of scripture says at the end of his life with his dying words, of all the things I could pass on to you, of all the things I could leave the next generation with, of all the things that I need to make sure you understand, the only thing you need to know is know God and know him more every day. Now, before we begin to think that this is just one person's encouragement, let me show you another thing. Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter three quite arguably the foremost apostle who has ever lived. We'll say with his dying words as well. But what things were gained to me, Philippians 3? These I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of what? The knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him. And as Paul is saying, I have, I have gained a lot of things. I've gained a lot of status. I've done a lot of amazing things. And nothing compares to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Understand, nothing matters but knowing him. Paul will say in 1 Corinthians, I have come to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's not that it's not that like gaining knowledge in other areas doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter at all in comparison to knowing Jesus. If you're gonna get one thing right, make it your eternal pursuit to get to know God every single day. And Peter says, you wanna know what's interesting? Is when you count everything as loss and simply pursue knowing Jesus more, you know what you find? You have access to everything that you need and thought you needed. So just pursue him. Just run after him. Just chase him. Second Peter, this word for knowledge used in Second Peter chapter one, 
In the Greek, it translates to this definition, to coming to know. It, it translates coming to know. It's both a now and not yet word. In other words, uniquely in 2 Peter chapter 1, this isn't the normal word used for knowledge or to know. It's a very unique word, and, and it, it, is, it is a holistic word. It means both knowing Jesus for salvation and continuing to know him more each and every day. In other words, once you know Jesus for, tra for, for salvation, that's when the journey begins of getting to know the depths of who he is and his goodness and his grace and his mercy. And Peter said, don't stop now just because you, your salvation is secure. Get to know him more every day. Don't allow anything to be taken from you. Don't give in to the lust of this world, the lust of the flesh. And interestingly, this word knowledge is, is personal, relational, and intellectual. It all matters because the reality is when it comes to our spiritual growth, you got to understand the head and the heart are never divorced. I must grow in my knowledge of him personally, relationally, and intellectually every day, continuing to come to know who he is. Because the reality is this, friend, the more you grow in your knowledge of God, the more your eyes will be open to see and experience the depth of his riches and benefits that you have received by the power of his Holy Spirit. You've already received it. But just because you have been given all things pertaining to life and godliness, as Peter says, does not mean you are accessing it nor aware of it. And that's the difficult part. Peter says, with the last few words that I get, I'm gonna help you to understand you have all things pertaining to life and godliness. You can live a godly life. Not a sinless life, but a godly life. You're gonna make some mistakes. You have all things. Don't believe this lie of lack that says that God is withholding things from you. You have it all. But how grace and peace are multiplied to you is by getting to know him at a deeper level every day. And it doesn't mean that God gives you more grace. It doesn't mean that God gives you six teaspoons of grace today, and tomorrow, if your spiritual diet allows for it, he'll give you seven. That's not how it works. You have all grace. Why? Because you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life, the Spirit of Almighty God. Therefore, all the hope you need, you already got. All the joy you need, you already got. All the peace you need, you already have in the person of the Holy Spirit. But as I go on this journey of coming to know him more every day, my spiritual eyes of understanding are opened up to recognize the depths of the peace that I have access to, the depths of the grace that I have access to, the depths of the hope and the joy and the life that I have been given. Friend, there is this lie of lack that you need to not believe any longer. The enemy would love for you to start to believe this lie that you lack something because of the circumstances that you're facing. It's been his play since the very beginning. Let me help you understand. Genesis chapter three, the serpent comes to Eve in the garden. They have been given all access to the garden. Tree of life is there, all access. Tree of knowledge of good and evil, they've been told they're not, not to eat from. They've been given access to life. Told not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Serpent comes and convinces Eve that it is because God is withholding goodness from her that she ought to eat of that tree. Begins to lie to her and say, God just doesn't want you to be like him, that's why. God's withholding good things from you. Hear me, God's not withholding good things from you. God's protecting you from things that aren't for you right now. And Eve believes the lie that she is deficient in something that there is something she doesn't have. And yet, they're walking with God. They have the tree, they have all of it. But he convinces her that she's lacking something. And so what? She reaches, lusts after something that she doesn't need. Similarly, fast forward, when Jesus is led into the wilderness to be tempted, led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, the enemy comes to Jesus and and you can go back and recount the dialogue. And, and he says, if you'll just bow down to me, I'll give you 
all of this as if it wasn't his to begin with. He even tried to get Jesus with this lie of lie, that somehow your heavenly father's withholding something from you. It's not yours. But if you do what I say, I'll give it to you. How many of you know that that's never actually true anyways? The lie of the enemy says, I'll, I'll give this to you if you do this. He seems to change the script immediately after you do it and pull it away. It doesn't work. This lie of, of lack, trying to get you to reach after things as if you don't have it already. Hear me, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have everything that you need. You do. It is just a journey of me going deeper in my knowledge of God that opens my eyes up to see the depths of his riches and his benefits and his goodness that I have access to. It's a lie of lack. Hear me, friend, the enemy works overtime trying to get you to devalue what you have and misunderstand who you have. But until your spiritual eyes of understanding are opened to the presence of God and in turn satisfied by only the things of God, you can have all the status, money, toys, and popularity in this world, but you'll continue to be crushed under the weight of insecurity connected to this lack of lie, this, this lie of lack. It produces this insecurity that I, I, I need something. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I, I'm deficient in something, and so I reach. I'm striving for I'm lusting after something that, that I don't really need. That I, maybe even something good that I already have access to in the person of God, but I'm reaching outside of the bounds of my relationship with God in order to try to find it. Don't believe the lie. You have what you need. Let me show you, Psalm 23, verse one, the psalmist seemed to understand this when he said, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I lack nothing. Matthew 6, 23, look, look at how prevalent, look at how much scripture speaks against this lie that you and I are submitted every single day. Because hear me, even though we do great today, we'll face something difficult tomorrow. And the next circumstance, the enemy is waiting right around the corner. See, say, hey, you wouldn't be facing this if you, if you had everything you needed. I can get you out of this if you do this. You, you wouldn't even be in this situation if God would just give you access to this, it's a bold faced lie. And hear me today, some of you need to understand, you wouldn't understand some of the depths of God's goodness, grace, and mercy on display in your life had you not learned it in that circumstance that you're facing. It doesn't make the circumstance better, but it does help my inner man be able to walk through it knowing that my God who will supply all of my needs according to his glorious riches is with me in it. Look at how prevalent this lie is and how much scripture speaks to it. Again, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what will happen? All of these things will be added unto you. Colossians chapter two, verse nine through 10 says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him just dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And watch, and you are complete in him. You don't need anything else, you need him. And you need to know him more so you realize how much you actually need him and the depths of your need that he, he meets. You are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Psalm 81, 84 verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Philippians 4.19, and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter one, verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, watch this, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Pay attention, the divine qualifier to experiencing all that pertains to life and godliness is knowing him and continuing to know him more every day. You have access to everything that you need in him. But we must get to know him more every day. And this is Peter and Paul's dying words to the churches that they would leave behind to keep growing in your knowledge of him. But the reality is we live in an age where we can gain more information faster than ever before. You can find out anything and almost everything about any person you want in a matter of seconds. But just because you know about them doesn't mean you know them. 
And my fear is that we have a generation who knows a lot about God but does not know him. And therefore, when we face circumstances that are difficult, it's much easier to believe the lie that God is somehow not as good as I've heard because I don't actually know him to be good. I've just heard that he's good. Somebody said it. And so I face a difficult circumstance and now the lie comes in that, oh, you wouldn't be facing this if God wasn't withholding things from you. He's not as good as you thought. And maybe that might be why we have so many young people running away from church and God right now because they have not come to know him and are not continuing to know him. They simply know about him. Hosea chapter four, verse six says, my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. Hear me, if there's any lack at all, it's our lack of knowledge of the goodness of God. We know the songs, but we don't know the freedom that they speak of. We know the words, but we don't know the power. We know the rules, but we don't know the ruler. We know about God, but do we know him? Do I know him? And am I continuing to know him more every day? Hear me, you don't, you grow into grace. Grace doesn't grow. Because you already have it all in the person of the Holy Spirit in your life. You've received it. So when scripture talks about growing in grace, when scripture talks about grace being multiplied to you, again, it's not that there's like a certain amount that you get and then another amount. No, 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 it's as I grow in my knowledge of God, I step deeper into an understanding of all of the grace that I have access to, all of the hope that I have access to. I wonder today, have we merely known him to a point? See, there's a lie of lack, but then there's this lie of laziness as well that says, I, I know Jesus, I know him, but we don't take the next step that the apostle Peter is encouraging to continue to know him more every day. And I wonder, have we merely simply known Jesus to a point to secure our eternity and then thought that we're good, we're done? And maybe is that what is leading to the hopelessness we feel in our situation that we're in? The peace, the, the lack of peace that we feel. Maybe it's not that peace is escaping you, but that you just haven't stepped into understanding the depth that you have already, that you have access to. Maybe it's, maybe it's not that, that all of this is missing. Maybe it's just that I have, I've stopped in my continuing to know him and have thought that this is just, this is just it. In fact, one comment, commenter said it like this. There is too frequently within the Christian church the lie that all is well. We're still on top. We can still overcome the enemy of our souls with no more knowledge of our faith than we have at the present moment. Coldness of soul may be just as threatening to the fellowship of Christ's people as the hatred of the enemy. Friend, we gotta continue to know him. In fact, this is Peter's encouragement and, and many scholars and theologians will draw connection to this picture we see in, in John 11 to what Peter is talking about here in 2 Peter chapter one. In, the, in John 11, Lazarus is dead and Jesus is coming to meet him, his friend who is dead. He's been dead for four days and, and Jesus shows up and the Bible says that, that, that Jesus calls out to Lazarus in the tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus is miraculously raised from the dead and walks out of the tomb. But I, if you've read the story before, you know what happens. Lazarus comes out, but he is still bound by all of the same deathly grave clothes from four days ago. Can you imagine? Like, think about it. I, that story continues to confound me because I'm like, Jesus, if you could raise him from the dead, like have him walk out in a suit with like background music. You know, like you could have done, I gave you life, but you must walk in that life and dig in to see it and to realize the depths of it. He comes out bound by these grave clothes and Jesus says, loose him and let him go. And maybe is this not the picture of many Christians today? We've received life, but have yet to let go of and unlearn some things and learn more about who our good God is in turn and allow our eyes of understanding to be opened to the depth of the life that we've received. This is why Romans will say, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There are some things, friend, you must unlearn about your old life 
and in place learn about this God that shaped you and molded you and fashioned you before you ever took a breath. And as you do, your eyes are opened to the depths of the life that you've been given. This is the picture that we have. And Peter is encouraging to keep the hunger for the Lord. Don't let the hunger go. Continue to hunger and thirst for him. Matthew chapter five, verse six said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Look at the promise of God. You will be filled when you search after me. Seek and you will find. When you make it your chief pursuit to get to know me, you will know me. You will know me more. You will know more of my character. You will be filled. You will find me. Search after me. Hunger after me. So I want to give you three things really fast as we close that help us know the Lord more. And the first is this, meditate on his word. You want to know the Lord more and in turn, your eyes to open up to all that you have access to in God. All that you have access to already, all things pertaining to life and godliness. Again, just because we have it doesn't mean we access it or are aware of it. But you want to learn more about who God is and in turn, open your eyes to see all of that. Meditate on his Word, John chapter one, verse one through five says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. I wanna get to know him more, I dig into his word. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life and life was the light of men and that light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. John chapter eight, verse 31, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you will what? Know the truth. Jesus will go on to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You will know this truth and the truth will make you free. James chapter one, verse 22, but be doers of the word and not simply hearers only and deceive yourselves. Joshua one, verse eight, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written. And watch this, here's what happens. When you get to know this God, you meditate on this word, what happens? For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Peter says, all good things pertaining to life and godliness, you will find as you search after God. Similarly here, Joshua makes a connection that in meditating on his word, all of that is opened up to you. Real success, you will find. Real prosperous, you will find. You will find all of that. Second thing is this, we wanna get to know him, follow after him. What a love in John chapter six, same Peter, Jesus speaking to Peter, this is, this is one of the moments Peter's confession of faith that really like sets the course of his direction of his life in many ways. Jesus, and, and if you're new to church and you're like, this is new, like knowing God, I, you can come up, we can ask questions, we can talk about this illustration here in a second. But John chapter six, this is where Jesus says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood if you're gonna be my disciples, okay? Obviously he's not speaking literally, okay? It's a reverent metaphor, communion, he's talking about, he's basically telling them it's gonna be difficult like, one, suffering, sacrifice is just gonna be a part of the journey. It's gonna be very hard to follow me. Um, and in fact, more people will not follow me than do. That's just is a reality. And he gives Peter this opportunity in the disciples. He says, do you too also wanna go away? Do you wanna leave? And watch Peter's confession of faith. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and watch this and know that you are the Christ the son of the living God. How do they know that? By following, Peter's saying, um, I've followed you long enough to realize none of, this, none of this other stuff matters. None of this other stuff suffices. Nothing benefits my life. Nothing leads my life. Somehow, some way, everything that is good is you and found in you. And I have followed you long enough to know that you alone have the words of eternal life. I'm reminded of Mark chapter four when the disciples are following the words of Jesus to get into the boat and Jesus gets in the boat and he's asleep uh, in the boat and, and they face this incredible storm and they're fishermen so they should have known storms and they're, they're not unaware of storms and this isn't new to them but for some reason this storm seems to be bigger than they've ever experienced. They run to Jesus, Jesus wakes up and Jesus speaks peace be still to the wind and the waves and they stop immediately. And the disciples look around in amazement and you know what they say? Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? 
hear me, some of the depths of the riches and the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God that you will come to learn, you will only learn in the circumstances that you face. And this is why we can't pray like, God, save me from everything. Don't let me go through difficulty. As much as I don't want to, the reality is we'll find ourselves in difficulty. But there is gold in every circumstance that you find yourself in. There is a treasure to behold of the character of God. And if you will just dig in and understand, I have the Holy Spirit, therefore I'm gonna be okay. See, there is something about the psalmist that is able to say it is well with my soul in the midst of chaos. And I wonder if it is not because he has come to know the God that he serves in such a way that he says, come hell or high water, I know this is hard. But he's with me, so I'm gonna be okay. We're gonna get through this. I mean, there is gold in your circumstance, but you must, again, there are things that you won't learn about the character of God outside of the circumstance that you presently face. So don't run from it. Lean into him. Cast all your cares and burdens and worries on him and allow him to fill your soul. Allow him to lead you. Allow him to illuminate more of his character and his nature to you in the midst of the trials that you face. And the third thing, the third way we get to know the Lord is we walk by the Spirit. Galatians chapter five, verse 16 encourages us. Remember, Peter says, don't give in to the lust of the flesh. Don't give in to the lust of this world. That is the alternative. We either seek the knowledge of God and in turn find everything that we need, or we give in to the lust of this world and we begin to reach for things outside of the character and the will of God. I don't want that to happen to you. So just get to know God and I promise you will find everything that you need in him. And you'll find you have access to a lot more than you thought you did. Galatians chapter five, verse 16 says, I say then walk by the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you walk by the spirit, you don't fulfill those lusts. And he leads you into a deeper knowledge of who God is. And in turn opens your eyes of understanding, your spiritual eyes of understanding to see all of the goodness of God, present, available, accessible to you. Even Jesus' encouragement towards the end of his earthly ministry as, his, as he's on the way to the cross. He would tell his disciples, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, John 16, it is to your advantage that I go away. How could that be so? For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. He will go on to say, and he will teach you of things that I have not had time to teach you in my three years. And if you submit to him, if you follow his leading, if you walk in step with him, he will remind you of all of the things that I have taught you. So no matter what you face, you will know that I am with you and I have everything that you need. I am everything that you need. Friend, may this be our chief pursuit, to know him, but not stop at knowing him for salvation, but continuing to know him every day of our life and recognize peace is available to me. Hope is available to me. Joy is available to me. Life is available to me and to access it at the deepest level I possibly can every single day. And may tomorrow, as I grow in my knowledge of God, may grace and peace be multiplied in my life. You've been given all things pertaining to life and godliness. Don't believe the lie anymore that you're deficient, that you lack anything. Because Paul says those things that you are tempted to believe that you lack, I have had at one point in my life and none of them matter in comparison to knowing Jesus. Peter will say all of the things that you think you need, you will find as you dive deeper into the revelation of who God is in your life. Jeremiah chapter nine, as we close says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and he knows me.
friend, may it be our heart's desire to daily glory in the reality and the revelation that I know God. There is nothing greater that you can pass down to the next generation than the knowledge of God and the example of what a life lived in full sold out pursuit of the knowledge of God looks like. There is nothing greater. Psalmist will say, no matter what you face, be still and know that I am God. In Jesus' prayer in John 17, he says, and this is eternal life. This is what it boils down to, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Friend, my prayer for us today is simply this, that our chief pursuit would be solely and completely knowing God more. That we would not give in to the lie of lack any longer and that we would not be swayed to be lazy in our pursuit of knowing him either. But we would understand that there is a knowing that is both now and not yet, that is personal, relational, and intellectual. Would we heed the words of both the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul and recognize that nothing matters or compares to knowing Jesus Christ and Him crucified? You have everything you need. You have access to everything that you need pertaining to life, true life, abundant life, everlasting life in the person of Jesus, in the presence of the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Chase him, run after him. Make it your sole pursuit. Annoyingly, make it your sole pursuit. There is nothing greater we could pass on to the next generation that's not my words, that's Paul and Peter's. The greatest thing of value I could pass on is the knowledge of God. And what that pursuit looks like. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would encourage, challenge, strengthen, and equip all of us to walk in this way. God, we want to know you more. We must know you more. In this hour, in this present hour, God, we sense the urgency. God, and I pray that you would find us diligent in the protection of our personal lives and diligent in our pursuit of knowing you more every single day. I pray when we aren't, Holy Spirit, you would convict us because there are depths to your character and your nature that you desire we know that we might be strengthened in this life. God, we need you. Would you speak to us, Holy Spirit? Would you lead us? And in turn, would our eyes of understanding be opened to the vastness, the depth, the extent of your riches, your goodness, your holiness. You are so good, God, and you only do good. Thank you that you don't withhold anything from us. We love you and worship you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. I hope you were blessed by this message, and I truly hope you heard the Lord speaking to you through it. Before you go, make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new message is posted. And make sure to leave us a comment below sharing what God spoke to you and how he used this message in your life. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time.